Recently, our client John met his banker to discuss plans for a clean energy building. What he found was a shared passion for building something more, momentum for change. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. The following production is part of the We Be Geeks podcast collective. From days long ago, from uncharted regions of the universe, comes a legend. The dream that came through a million years, that lived on through all the tears. It came here, the Fandom Nexus. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to our host as he plugged in his microphone. I have a podcast! Here he is, your spider pan, Jeremy. Hello! That's right. It is time to light the lights. Oh my gosh, it is time to, what is it, make the, put on makeup, it's time to dress up right. What is, I'm getting all my lines up. I had it in my head when I started hitting buttons. <laughs> it's time to start the music, isn't it? It's time to light the lights. Yeah, because we're going to talk some Muppets today, all right? That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to share some fun and some memories with the Muppet Show. Uh, I plan to have done this last week, but things just did not quite go the way I had planned it. And uh, I, I, actually, even from the uh, how I got my feedback from y'all was not quite the way I planned it. I wanted uh, some emails. I asked for emails on our social media pages. By the way, are you following us on social media? Neverland, the Fandom Nexus, we are on Facebook, and that's generally where I ask some questions in both our group and our fan page. And I was asking people, well, you know, to share some memories about the Muppets, and I gave some samples like what your favorite Muppet is and stuff. And I got one response to what their favorite Muppet, but I didn't really get a whole lot of uh, why is that your favorite Muppet or anything like that. I just kind of got, oh, yeah, I sent, you know, one person sent me an email, uh, but I mainly got like a lot of images and some people saying who their favorite Muppet was or a favorite guest. Uh, but we're going to talk about that later with some of our memories from the Muppet Show back in the time of the 70s. And we're going to talk about that. Also, though, I do want to talk about there was a uh, large PlayStation showcase yesterday. Uh, and since I happen to own a PlayStation, I was quite interested in this. A lot of new games uh, were announced or games that we knew were coming. We got to see a little bit more about uh, including the upcoming Spider-Man 2 game. So uh, I am uh, very excited to talk to you about that. Got a chance to have a look at it. Oh my goodness, what they showed us was phenomenal. I really, 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 really enjoyed it. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, but I've got all kinds of other fun stuff, a lot of different news. Uh, and, of course, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to have to hop up onto my Facebook page here and be able to share with you everything that... Uh, that actually was shared with me about the Muppet Show. But let's just go ahead and get this show rolling when we talk about what you have been watching. Hello out there in TV land. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. A Neverland Podcast Television Review. I did get around to watching the Muppets Electric Mayhem series. Uh, it's uh, I don't know if they're going to do any more seasons. It was, uh, what, about 10 episodes? They put them all up on Disney Plus all in one go, and so I sat and watched them uh, over the course of the last, uh, I guess, couple of weeks, something like that. And uh, I will say that I did enjoy it. It was fun. I did laugh out loud. You had a few good belly laughs as I, I posted to Facebook when somebody was talking about it. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was funny. Had some fun with the idea. Uh, there was a lot of really great nods to us old school fans. Uh, like with the Electric Mayhem, I actually had had an old contract that was the standard rich and famous contract. Uh, which is what you might remember from the original Muppet movie. Uh, but there was a lot of different nods. There was even a mention of the baseball diamond from the, the great Muppet caper. So they threw a little fun bits in like that for us. And then uh, just had kind of a fun story that they just found like little little bits of time to tell the story and have a little bunch of little stories, almost very much like a sitcom. And I, I really did have a good time watching it. I, I thought it was 
quite fun. You didn't really fully have a villain. No, you had a character you thought was kind of going to be the villain, but he, you know, he really wasn't such a bad guy. Uh, he was trying to help, and he just uh, he was trying to help his own way, and didn't quite understand, I guess, some stuff of how the band would work, and so stuff he would he would do. He was modernizing them, and by the end of the series, we almost kind of got a a look and a criticism of the modern social media society, the that society that we live in, and it was a criticism of that. Uh, by the time you got to the last third of the series, because uh, that's one of the things the the so it's sort of the antagonist of the series. He wasn't really a bad guy, and he was trying to help out a lot of doing stuff. Uh, but he was trying, of course, to make the the Electric Mayhem into influencers. He wanted to have their music on an app so people would have it on their phones. You know, he was wanting to do a lot of stuff that we expect nowadays to happen with technology. But it was, you know, well, I don't want to spoil anything. But uh, they really took the time to say, well, is that really the best for everything? You know, is there something we're losing uh, in our social media world where we're not getting that? that actual interaction, human interaction. Because, we, you know, the first half of the series, we get to show how the, the Muppet Mayhem or the Electric Mayhem is just making magic through their interactions with people and then putting them on social media, they lose that bit of magic. Uh, so it was very interesting going that way. So uh, I really did enjoy it. Uh, it, it had, you know, I, I feel like I kind of spoiled a little bit, but not really. Uh, but that's kind of the overall uh, theme of it. It had a lot of guest stars in every episode, a lot of guest stars that I was not familiar with. Uh, a lot of guest stars that were like very old school, and they were just kind of fun to see them pop up. Uh, you know, so I didn't quite enjoy every guest star. Some of them were almost like, um, and the this season of The Mandalorian, where why are they here? Okay, I don't know. That seems like a weird cameo thing. I mean, Star Wars doing cameos like that was weird, but uh, Muppets we expect that sort of thing to have some cameos. But overall, I, I do recommend it. It actually was fairly fun, and I had a good time. So we move on to the next question I always like to ask is, what have you been playing? And there's been a couple of things I've been playing this week. Uh, one of them, I am finally sat down and started playing the 2018 God of War game. Now, I kind of slowly worked my way into this because I, I don't really like the character of Kratos. He's kind of a jerk. You know, from what, uh, what little bit I've played of the original games and some video I've seen of the original games, you know, he's not, he's very much the anti-hero. I mean, uh, uh, I don't find him as a personality a likable guy. He's just angry, you know. And uh, so this is kind of giving him a chance to relook at his character. And this is you don't really have to have played the earlier games to come into this one. And I tried to play it once before, but it had all your your major attack buttons were on a trigger button, and I couldn't quite adapt to that. But then uh, had a friend of mine, Seth, was saying, "Well, you know, you can change that." So I thought, "Okay, well, I'll come back to it at some point." Because when I got my PS5, I did buy the edition that came with a digital copy of the sequel, Ragnarok, uh, to the God of War games. Uh, but yeah, I I had played the Resident Evil four enough times. So I'm like, okay, well, I need to play something else. And like, you know, let me go ahead and just play this God of War game. And so I did change it to a more of a classic control setting where my attack button was on square and stuff like that. And I have been playing through it. I have not yet completed it, but it is a lot of fun just exploring around the area and finding hidden treasures and different things to collect, that kind of thing. I, I'm having a lot of fun. The story is interesting. You see basically a man who's, he's realized he's been, you know, his life has not been great, and it, but he's trying to, to be better about it. He's trying to learn how to be a father. Uh, he doesn't know how to show affection to his son. Uh, you, you, but you see these moments where the son doesn't see where he almost wants to put his hand on his son's shoulder when they're dealing with an emotional thing. And the overall story arc has been uh, his wife has passed, and he wants to take her ashes up the tallest peak, because that was her final request, the tallest, the tallest mountain in all the realms. Uh, and it's the adventure going on doing that. In the meantime, he's also kept it from his son. That uh, Now, I don't know a whole lot of the history of Kratos, but I know at some point he killed Ares, became the god of war, but he, he swore vengeance on all the Greek gods and killed them all. But he had he was a demigod who became a god, uh, an Olympus Greek god. And so now he's in the Norse area, the area of Norse mythology. He has not told his son that his son would basically be a demigod at that point because you're a half human, half god. And uh, the Norse gods are aware of this, and of course, you know they they want to do their own film. They they like to basically point out that these these old mythological gods like this are all really not very nice people. 
Uh, and so there's uh, there's that kind of storyline, and I think something big is coming along from that part of it. But he really is just trying to him and his son go and take the ashes up the highest uh, part. And I've gotten up to the point where we're going actually going to go to uh, Jotunheim, I believe, or Jotunheim, I don't know, where the uh, the land of the ice giants, because there's the the tallest peak in all of our, the worlds of uh, realms, would be there. Uh, so that's where I'm at now. Uh, I'm hoping I get a chance to play again this this coming weekend. I haven't really got a chance to play this week. I've been very very busy this week. Uh, with my work, uh, going filming different ads, uh, even one company that does uh, does permanent lights on your home, and so I had to come back and do a night shoot. Uh, also had an interesting news story here in Missouri that y'all might have heard about, um, where a uh, a Catholic nun was uh, they dug her up after four years of being in the ground because they want to move her inside to the church building that she helped founded, and she was very well preserved. And uh, Catholics look at that and say a miracle. So. I won't say much more on that. Uh, I'll leave that be. But I went and uh, I've shot some footage. They used. The, I looked at the story actually just a little bit ago that uh, one of our reporters actually went out later uh, to the place to actually talk to some people and do a full story there. And they used a little bit of the footage I shot. Uh, I hope they found more use for some of the other footage because they barely touched all some of my footage because she shot her own. I'm like, well, what did I go out there for? You know, so, oh, well. But anyways, so yeah, I've been very busy. I'm actually really tired this week, but I was like, you know what? I need to get out. I got to talk to my people. It's I, I, you know, I'm, I meant to have something every week, and now we're going to go every two weeks at the rate I'm going. But I wanted to talk to my people, and that is you, about all the fun, different things, especially considering all the fun things announced by Sony. Plus, there's a lot of other stuff that I, I didn't know was coming. And some of the stuff you probably heard before, because, you know, I've been gathering stuff for a couple of weeks. But, you know, let's have fun. Let's talk about this stuff. Spanning the Disney and Geek Universe to bring you the best in comics, toys, movies, and entertainment. This is news from around Neverland. All right, now this is something I I had no idea this was happening. So, Superman, way, way back, you know, in 1941 through 1943, Max Fleischer, you might know this, uh, did animated shorts of Superman. And the animation is great. Max Fleischer also would go on and do uh, some great Popeye cartoons. Uh, I don't remember when he was actually working on Popeye. But uh, these actually have hit public domain. But uh, Warner Brothers, uh, they own the merchandising rights and everything. So they have put these on Blu-ray. And they've got some new 4K scans of the original negatives. And uh, they have put these... And their 17 theatrical shorts, they have put these out on a nice Blu-ray disc. It's labeled as Max Fleischer's Superman. Now, Max Fleischer was quite the rival for Walt Disney back in the day. Uh, and Walt Disney did speak on it, like, of how good Fleischer was. Pardon me while I drink a drink of water. So these are out, uh, I guess, in stores. I have not gotten a chance to go look for it, but I, I do want to pick this up. Uh, that's got a four out of five by five rating on uh, superhero hype uh, for just outstanding quality. And this is also where uh, the story is that, you know, when you, I have read some of the original action comics with Superman and he did not fly. He leapt over buildings in a single bound. But and when it came to the animated one, Max Fleischer says, well, you know, it's interesting when you show him jump and come back, it, he kind of looks like he might have flown. Can we just make him fly? And that's where Superman's flying ability apparently came from. Uh, but yeah, this is available. Uh, I I definitely want to pick this up. This is pretty exciting. I mean, I have uh, watched a lot of these. Uh, right now, you can even see them with some ads in Tubi. But nice and cleaned up and good high definition. Uh, I am down with that. Something else coming up in just about six days from the time of this recording here on May 31st, the entire Indiana Jones, we'll call it a series at this point, is coming to Disney+. Plus. And Paramount still, of course, has the rights to this stuff, but Disney, of course, owning Lucasfilm, also now has some rights, so they've finally worked out a deal to put them on Disney+. Plus. This will be all four current movies. Plus, apparently the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles will be on Disney+, Plus as well, for your viewing pleasure. Um, I've never watched the Young Indiana Jones. I've seen, like, one episode of it. Uh, recently, uh, Lost Boy Philip bought a digital version of all of that, but, uh, like, of course, he buys it, and then, of course, they decide to release it to where he'll be able to watch on Disney+. Plus. 
just figures, doesn't it? Uh, so I'm going to sit and maybe try to watch Young Indiana Jones. And of course, I you know love the original trilogy. The fourth one, actually, we're up on a, a kind of an anniversary of the fourth one. I think it's been 10 years. With a, from the or, or fifteen years, I think it was my five year anniversary that my wife and I went to go see Kingdom of the Crystal Skull before uh, making a return trip for our anniversary. It was our five year anniversary at the time. Uh, we went back to Omaha where we went on our honeymoon. Uh, we're now at our twenty year anniversary uh, as of Wednesday, the twenty fourth. Uh, but we don't have the money to go back to do our our Omaha fi- every five years. Go to Omaha to the zoo and everything. Uh, th- th- we couldn't do it this year. Uh, heck, and tomorrow is my 46th birthday. My goodness. Yes, I'm getting old, folks. So, yeah, but uh, that's coming up here the 31st. So you get a chance to watch the Indiana Jones movies, although you probably own copies of them, I'm sure. But, you know, getting a chance to watch the young Indiana Jones Chronicles, you might not own a copy of that, and you may not have seen it since they're on TV. But uh, well, we'll give us all a t- chance to check it out. Now, also something, I uh, and I just uh, copied and pasted this. Uh, did, I, did I list the website where I pulled this from? Well, there, there's a documentary called The Greatest Geek Year Ever, 1982. And this, uh, as it's described, is an inside look back at the greatest geek year in cinema ever, 1982, with stars, directors, writers, producers, critics, and pop culture historians sharing their insights about such classics films as E.T., The Extraterrestrial, Blade Runner, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Poltergeist, Tron, and many more. Filled with exclusive interviews, rare behind-scenes footage, and incredible never-before-seen clips, and a fun, lively, no-holds-barred celebration of the legendary movie-going year. Greatest Geek Year Ever, 1982. We'll take viewers behind the scenes of the biggest and most influential movies ever made at a time when fandom was at its infancy. Uh, This is written and produced by Mark A. Altman, directed uh, also Roger Lay Jr., executive produced by Burge Garabedian. I don't know how to say his name, I'm sorry. Scott Mance, Thomas P. Vitale, Eric Carnegie, and Aaron Ratner also serve as producers. Uh, Now, I believe this is coming to a streaming service. I seem to have not carried over that information when I saw this. I remember seeing it on Facebook, and I clicked in the article and grabbed some of this to share with y'all. But keep an eye on a streaming service. Uh, I don't believe this is coming to theaters. But uh, keep an eye. I I did see something else that's a a documentary that's coming here that I didn't grab for a news story. Um, I don't recall that I grabbed a trailer. It was basically a trailer I saw. But there's a documentary that I'm not sure where it's popping up from, but it's, it's a Gene Wilder documentary. I saw something on it actually on YouTube. I saw this trailer, but there wasn't anything indicating, all right, is this going to be on a streaming service? How how am I supposed to watch this? I don't know. But uh, here's something else, some uh, news you may have already heard. The Hollywood Reporter telling us, uh, well, I'm getting, you know, I need to skip an ad here, I guess. Hulu and Disney Plus can tend to be combined in one app services to stay separate. There's a lot of people talking about, oh, well, you know, because Disney is working on some final stuff to get all of Hulu. And as it is, I mean, I'm paying for a bundle where I get Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus um, all together. And there was talk that the They'll be they'll be combining both you know like Disney Plus is going to go away and it'll all just be on Hulu or something but really I guess they're just combining some some uh, content will be on available on Hulu as well as on Disney Plus I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work uh, but it uh, it says here Disney holds the majority stake in Hulu while Comcast owns a third starting in January 2024 Comcast will use its put option to require Disney to buy its stake or Disney can use its buy option to force Comcast to sell its stake. The Disney executive had previously signaled a greater willingness to part with the streaming platform. Iger appeared on CNBC on February 9th, spoke about Disney wanting to move away from undifferentiated entertainment, saying of Hulu, everything is on the table right now, so I am not going to speculate whether or not a buyer or seller of it. So I I wouldn't jump too much on, oh, Disney Plus is going away, it's all going to become Hulu or something like that. It's it's still a pending thing, and it sounds like they're just going to maybe shift some content around. Uh, I don't know if Disney's going to buy it or going to, you know, who knows. Brief thing I have to at least mention. We got a, a little tease for what they're calling Mortal Kombat 1. They've rebooted the franchise pretty much once again. Some time, time doohickey-wicky, um, timey-wimey stuff going on. Uh, I looked at it. I'm not going to cover much of it because, holy cow, some serious ultra gore is what I've labeled that. Uh, I mean, more so than I'd even find in any horror game that I've played. Like Resident Evil 4 was not even as gory and nasty as some of the stuff they put in Mortal Kombat games. So I've really, I've fallen off of the franchise a long time ago. But I figured it was at least worth a mention as it did happen. You've also probably heard the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser is closing 
permanently. Uh, this last voyage will be September the 30th, and then the, the Disney has not yet decided what they're going to do with this location. I mean, they put a lot of time and effort into building the thing, but it was just too darn expensive for most people to even consider going. Those people who did go apparently did enjoy it, had a good time. If, yeah, if you can afford the $6,000 person or whatever, I think. Uh, so, yeah, it was a really overpriced experience. Uh, it was, I don't know what to necessarily call it a bad idea, but it was kind of a bad idea to have to build something that you're going to have to charge that much for anyone to do because you're not going to have a lot of people who, you know, the common person is clearly not going. Okay, but I do have some stuff from the PlayStation Showcase from uh, yesterday, and uh, some of this has got some good audio. I can't remember what all had audio that you're going to be able to hear something. Hopefully this one, they'll tell you what it's about. Uh, so let me just click and play this video here. Later this year, we will launch a dedicated device that enables you to stream any game from your PS5 console using remote play over Wi-Fi. Internally known as Project Q, it has an 8-inch HD screen and all of the buttons and features of the DualSense wireless controller. We look forward to sharing more information in the near future. I'm also pleased to reveal our first ever PlayStation earbuds, which will bring next generation audio immersion to PS5 and PC. They simultaneously connect to smartphones via Bluetooth. New wireless technology will deliver lossless audio with low latency, giving you outstanding sound quality while you're playing. Look out for more details soon. PlayStation. Okay, so when looking at this, it's like it's it's kind of like a new controller, but it's it's for remote play. This basically looks like a Nintendo Switch. Now, those of you who own a PlayStation, like I do, will be familiar with a remote play. That is where I can get on a laptop or my computer here, and I can play with my PlayStation systems because I still have a PS4 that'll do this. Uh, I can play with it when I'm not at home, right? You know, I can play on a laptop somewhere as long as I have good Wi-Fi. Or, or even if I'm within the home area, I can, I can play with it. Uh, and so this would be the idea that with this device, you could be somewhere and by the, via the Internet, remote into your home system, provided, of course, you've turned on remote play on your system. Uh, I've mainly I've used this uh, like I'm right now where I record it. I'm up in my office and I have all my toys and my fun stuff in my office. And I've got my game systems in here as well, but also downstairs in, uh, in my bedroom uh, with where, you know, the master bedroom where my wife and I are at. Uh, I do have the PS4, and I can actually sit down there, get into my PS4, and log in and, and play stuff on my PS5 if I want to. I tend to not do anything that's going to have a lot of fun haptic feedback because I don't think the PS4 controller will, you know, nearly translates as well the haptic feedback you have on a PS5 controller. But, you know, for old PS4 games, or if I want to just play around with the Disney Dreamlight, or if I want to, you know, a lot of different things, I can, you know, tap into my PS5 you know, and play some different things that are on that console. Uh, so it's very, very, very cool uh, to do that kind of thing. I've been uh, rather enjoy it. So, but this is basically a device that will allow you to do the same with a remote device. And it's supposed to still have a lot of uh, haptic feedback and features. I have no idea how long your battery is going to last <laughs> on this thing, but I have a feeling probably not that long. All right. Now, I did mention I wanted to share Spider-Man 2. Uh, they, put, they put a couple of different things. They put some a gameplay reveal on there that was also on Marvel. Uh, the full, uh, full 12 minutes they combined it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the gameplay. It's very long, but what I do want to just play the audio for you is the introduction of a major villain in the game. As soon as the audio starts. <laughs> Takes a while to get there, doesn't it? Sergei. 
A fate you will not share. <laughs> I've been in your shadow for hours, but you sense nothing. Pathetic. I asked for an equal, and this is what you find. Sir. Perhaps a new hunting ground. Light the fires. The great hunt begins. So, Spider-Man 2 is coming out this fall. And uh, let me just read the description. says, Yes, PlayStation. Uh, Craven the Hunter makes his debut in Marvel's Spider-Man 2, and he's in search of an equal. That spells bad news for the inhabitants of Marvel's New York. Uh, yeah, so if you didn't catch Sergei and you didn't know what that means, that's Sergei Kravenoff, Craven the Hunter. Coming into this game as a major villain. Uh, now, let me tell you a little bit about the 10 minute, 52 second video that you can also find. Uh, like I said, this was all put together in one video uh, on, on Marvel's uh, YouTube channel, but they showed some of the gameplay and you get a little bit more of the story. So, when Craven comes to town, and those of you who are longtime listeners of the show, I'm sure I've talked about this with you all, I would have liked to have seen a Spider Man movie back when we were doing the Sam Raimi stuff. Uh, with, with, with introducing the lizard, uh, and and Craven at the same time would have worked it to work the you can have the whole Kurt Connell's lizard Kurt Connors lizard thing going on having Spidey know that that is his friend Kurt Connors as the lizard and then Craven the hunter shows up because he hears like there's this giant lizard monster and he wants to hunt it. I thought that would be a great movie. Well, we're getting that, but not as a movie. We're getting it as a major plot point of this game. Kirk Connors, who is the only person who might be, for those who played the original game, might be able to cure Harry Osborn of whatever illness, has become the lizard, and Craven has shown up to hunt him. So both Spider-Man and Miles Morales Spider-Man, he's the, the Brooklyn Spider-Man, uh, I, I don't know if they're ever going to call them something where that you can separate these two. It's, it'd be nice. It'd be convenient. Uh but yeah, that's not, I've already talked about my issues with that. Uh, but you know, they're they're having to work together to try to stop Craven from killing the lizard. So they and then while they also search for a way to turn him back to Kurt Connor so he can help save Harry Osborn. Uh, now also we got to see in a small cutscene of the first game, there's some sort of version of the symbiote around. Well, in this uh, gameplay trailer, we get to see the symbiote has infected Peter, and he is getting. Some of those anger issues the symbiote tends to have when uh, when we adapt this story, and he even had when he t when he talks to enemies and stuff, he's got more of a rougher, gr angrier voice going on, uh, and it's definitely making some changes personality. It also gives you some new wild Venom style abilities uh, in the symbiote suit. Uh, I'm seeing this potentially coming to a showdown between Peter and Miles as Miles tries to fight uh, to free Peter from the symbiote. I have a feeling there's going to be a, a heck of a good fight between him and Miles coming because, you know, by the end of this 10-minute uh, uh, bit of gameplay, Miles is talking to his friend who is helping out. Like, this this is not the Spider-Man I know. Something is wrong. Something is different about him. That's He's had a completely different personality. That is, like, not that's not him. Uh, so I, I foresee this being very, very interesting going forward. I'm quite... 
quite excited to see where it goes. Uh, some other things that were announced. Uh, we've got a new Assassin's Creed Mirage where they're getting back, I guess, to the classic style of Assassin's Creed. I've only played one Assassin's Creed game. I actually didn't really like it. I thought it was kind of frustrating. But, you know, big, there's fans of that series. So, uh, Also, we've got Phantom Played Zero. It's going to probably have a mature rating. Uh, I don't know if we'll play the, you that audio. A lot of uh, very, very much like a samurai epic kind of thing, which we're getting quite a few of those here lately. Uh, what's got my interest, though, is uh, we did get a look at Alan Wake 2. Also, Dragon's Dogma 2. I, I've never played the first one. I've heard of it. Uh, but there's some excitement around that one as well. But, I mean, Alan Wake 2, I'm excited for. I do have footage of me playing this online, by the way. But let's take a listen. I'm trapped here. In this nightmare. I write to escape. Every word is a step forward. Into darkness. I'm glad you're on this case with me, Anderson. It's right up your alley. The victim was one of their own. FBI Special Agent Robert Nightingale. So you knew our victim? Only the rumors. He was chasing a writer. Someone knew they were here. Was playing a game with them. The killer left a message. It's for us. The text is about us. We were all trapped in a horror story. The horror story wanted us dead. There's something I'm forgetting. Something important. Something's not right. Easy now. First things first. What's your name? And that's where they put the title Alan Wake 2 up. October 17th, 2023, right in time for Halloween. Uh, now, I will say about the original game, you can kind of call it a bit of a horror. It's more of a suspense thriller. Uh, but let me read some of the description PlayStation has over here. Alan Wake 2 releases October 17th, a long way to sequel to the award-winning cinematic action thriller and Remedy Entertainment's take on survival horror. A string of ritualistic murders and a super supernatural darkness begin to corrupt the locals of the quirky, idyllic small town of Bright Falls. Can Agent Saga and Anderson and Alan Wake break free from the desolate horror they've, they're trapped in and be heroes, be the heroes they need to be? Now, they're not saying it in here, but uh, what, and what people are commenting about is you can see Sam Lake... Uh, as a PS5 model, Sam Lake, he's kind of a high up guy with Remedy. Uh, they're a European company. Uh, R Remedy has been kind of linking some of their games together. Uh, in fact, there was uh, the Alan Wake storyline comes to play in Control in some DLC, which, if you haven't played Control, that was an outstanding game. I had a lot of fun playing with that one. Uh, and, you know, there's talk there's uh, going to be an Alan or a, a Max Payne remake. But. Looking at Sam Lake's face with his hair slicked back and having even the the voice of Max Payne be apparently his voice makes me think: Is this Max Payne as also an FBI agent? Maybe later on, in, you know, because you did have Max Payne three where he ends up like South America or something. I never played all of it. I don't know. I I tried to play uh, on the my old Xbox three sixty the Max Payne three, but I couldn't get into it. I don't know. It just it felt repetitive. It didn't feel like it. It didn't have the. Uh, the noir and uh, graphic novel style of the first two Max Payne games, and it just didn't didn't it didn't capture the magic of the original Max Payne. But I gotta wonder: is this really is this supposed to be Max Payne now? So they're connecting even those games into this uh, you know shared universe. Uh, I I don't know. I don't know for sure. I don't know what the answer is. But oh wow, if they're connecting it all, that is. Very awesome, uh, and I am super, super excited for that. That's coming up very soon. Let's see. I had three different things. I wanted to play some audio. There we go. Uh, oh, wait. That's the trailer park. Ha, ha. I got to go look and see other, other news, make sure I, if I've played everything. Okay, there's the, yes, Spider-Man 2, and I was going to play the thing, and I was going to play that. I guess, I guess I've played all the audio that I want to play for you for the news to be able to discuss. So that means it's time to go to the trailer park. Mama, now the gator got in the house. Now the gator? 
Give me that shovel. Come here. Oh. Oh. Get him on. Oh. Get that guy. Ah. Ew. Ah. The Neverland Trailer Park. Now, I've been collecting trailers since last week, so uh, uh, here's one that actually played. Uh, we, when did I go to the movie to go see that this was playing with? And I was like, hmm, interesting. Maybe it was with Guardians they played this. Must be. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. For the sum of our choices. And we cannot escape the past. Ethan, this mission of yours is gonna cost you. The world is changing. Truth is vanishing. War is coming. It's been a long time, friend. You've no idea the power I represent. It knows your story and how it ends. Listen to me. The world's coming after you. His fate is written. Shall we write yours too? If anything happens to them, there's no place that I won't go to kill you. That is written. What's your objective? What's your ultimate objective? Your life will always matter more to me than my own. None of our lives can matter more than this mission. I don't accept that. So July 12th is when this hits theaters. Uh, let me read you some description. Oh, I don't think they really have much description. Nope, here we go. In Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, Ethan Hunt, Tom Cruise, and his IMF team embark on their most dangerous mission yet, to track down a terrifying new weapon that threatens all of humanity before it falls into the wrong hands. With the control of the future and the fate of the world at stake, and dark forces from Ethan's past closing in, a deadly race around the globe begins. Confronted by a mysterious, all-powerful enemy, Ethan is forced to consider that nothing can matter more than his mission, not even the lives of those he cares about most. Uh, they don't have a list of the cast on here, but I recognize, I believe I saw Palm Clementoff or, yeah, I think it's, it's yeah, well, you know, Mantis uh, from the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Uh, Haley Atwell playing a role in here, and we all love Haley Atwell, don't we? Uh, you know, for her role, of course, in the Captain America franchise. Uh, so, I mean, a lot, a lot of recognizable actors, of course, a lot of returning ones. I'm a little behind on these Mission Impossible movies. I, I, heck, I never expected they would end up making this many of them. Uh, I remember seeing at least the first two in theaters. I saw the third one, I think, on a home video of some sort. I'm pretty sure I've watched the fourth one. I think is where I'm. I think that's where I've left off. Uh, but uh, they they don't number them, so it's kind of hard to keep track of, you know, what in the world's going on. Which one am I on? What's happening? I don't know. So, <laughs> but uh, they are available on streaming services to watch. I need to catch up and watch those because this does look interesting. And uh, I would like to go and check it out. And one thing I want to grant Tom Cruise, uh, he showed us with Top Gun Maverick, he is just out there to just make good movies and entertaining stories uh, and give us a few thrills. And so good on him, you know, making just entertainment. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, here's some interesting science fiction coming September 29th. It's called The Creator. What's heaven? It's a peaceful place in the sky. Are you going to heaven? No. Why not? 
You gotta be a good person to go to heaven. Ten years ago today, the artificial intelligence created to protect us detonated a nuclear warhead in Los Angeles. For as long as AI is a threat, we will never stop hunting them. This is a fight for our very existence. Whatever's in there, they're sure worried about someone getting in. Yeah, we're getting out. Did you locate the weapon? Yeah, it's a kid. Seatbelts. I do want to quit the trap. We are this close to winning the war. Execute her, or we go extinct. get me. Okay, so that is the creator coming September 29th. Uh, let me see if I have some description here to show it to read for you. From 20th Century Studios, says nothing. Uh, and what's what's interesting is somebody commented on YouTube. I absolutely love when studios make high budget original sci fi films like this. And when they when I say original, I just mean a film that's not an adaptation or a sequel. Because really, it's not necessarily uh, that original. Uh, it's, of course, it's man versus, uh, AI machines. Your, your AI overlords are waiting for you to die. You know, it's the Terminator franchise. It's the Matrix. However, this time they might have done something a little different. You have a little girl who is a robot and you have a, a other, uh, machines that have human faces, uh, in this. And so we get a little bit of elements of, if you played the game, Detroit became human, human, pardon me, uh. I was trying to keep myself from burping there. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, you have some elements of that where maybe it's the machines were uh, attempting to have some rights of like, oh, hey, we've uh, we've become intelligent. We just want to be able to live here. Uh, so there might be an element of that going on. It's hard to say exactly what they're doing here because this was just a teaser. Uh, but it seems like it's hard to tell who the right side is because uh, you know, the first half of this, you see the, uh, you know, the AI that was supposed to be protecting us on this this thing called heaven nuking Los Angeles and then beating up humans and stuff. But then you see also the humans are smashing up the machines. Uh, and that is something even the Matrix kind of was going in that direction. If you, But you had to, in order to, to understand the full Matrix trilogy, uh, we'll ignore that fourth movie, you had to have watched the Animatrix, where you kind of see that there is aggression on both sides, and really we just needed to find a way to have a peace. And so that's what makes the third Matrix movie actually work, is when we finally get a piece and we have a truce, like maybe we can learn to live together uh, with the machines, that kind of thing. So, uh, oh my gosh, I just see a thing here on Hulu about what is this? White men can't jump. We've, we've, there's a trailer on here about it. I don't think I'm going to click it though, but I don't know if that's a series or what. Uh, a new movie? They remade it. Oh goodness. Anyway, <laughs> I just saw that. Sorry. While I was sitting here on the YouTube page, uh, now. One thing I, I want to address, because I'm allowed to say this kind of thing now on my show, because we've kind of changed format, that he talks about good people go to heaven. Only good people go to heaven. Um, that's not what the Bible teaches. All of us, because none of us are truly good. But we are so worthy, uh, in the eyes of God, of worth him dying for to get us into heaven, right? Uh, not that we are worthy of getting into heaven on our own, uh, but we are of enough value. That's the word I should use, that... We get into heaven not because we are good, but because Jesus was good, and that he 
chose to pay our price, and then we can go if we accept him and receive that gift. So that is one thing, of course, movies are not going to ever get. But there it was. There's the gospel simplified for you. You're welcome. Uh, so, But th- that looks to be interesting. I'm going to keep an eye on that and see where it goes from this time out. Uh, I got another trailer. This is something comes in from Disney+. Plus. You already knew about it. It's Secret Invasion. We got a new look at it. An invasion is here, Rhodey. And we can't even tell who the invaders are. Fury, why haven't you called any of your special friends? This war is one I have to fight. Living on the edge to the end of our lives. From the sheepskin telling me lies. Alone. This world is burning, and it was you who lit the match. TikTok, Nick. This is personal. You're the most wanted man on the planet. Well, Mama always said I was special. Marvel Studios Secret Invasion, only on Disney+. Plus. We are less than a month away on this one. Uh, June 21st. This is coming very, very soon. Uh, and I'm curious to see what they've done. Now, I, I did see something about an article that, talking about this is the last time we were going to see Nick Fury and there's going to be a successor. Uh, now, I don't know. That could be. Uh, wow, I forgot the character's name, but we have seen the character. She is from the comics. Maria Hill. There we go. We have seen Maria Hill in the Avengers film. She's played by an actress who's been in previously in the um, How I Met Your Mother series. Uh, so I cannot think of the actress's name, but um, I wonder if they're going to have that. Because I know for a time in some comics, Maria Hill was running S.H.I.E.L.D. and uh, she was not very good at it. She didn't have a good personality where she didn't get along with a lot of superheroes and they really didn't like her very much. So we'll just see what they're we're go- going for with that. So I am uh, I'm definitely curious to see how that goes and I will go ahead and I will check that out. One last trailer, uh, literally the last trailer, the final trailer for the upcoming Flash movie. Here you go. Oh, my God! Flash! Hi. I love you. Thank you. Touching you into Mr. Wayne. No, please don't. Um, I need you here now, Barry. So you're saying you could travel back in time. But Bruce, I can fix things. I can save people. I can save my mom. I can save your parents. You can also destroy everything. I love you, Bob. I love you too. So how was it this week? How's school? School was good. Oh, this is mad trippy. Dude, this is catastrophic. This world must die. I'm not going to lose there again. It's not Clark. My name is Kara. I will help you. Interesting group. Want some help? He's Batman? You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Oh, this rips! We're in uncharted territory. Batman, what do we do? We try not to die. Are you ready? Ready. Let's go. You have fancy friends. No, it was an Uber. Oh, exec. So June 16th, The Flash. Now, we all know the reason why we want to see this is Michael Keaton reprising his role as Batman. Now, what I'm curious about, 
So if, if you ever read, uh, I don't know that I read the whole Flashpoint Paradox, but I think they made a, a DC made an animated movie of it. Of it, but uh, when Barry Allen goes back in time and uh, saves his parents, causing the Flashpoint Paradox, the Batman that that, that he was in the world that he ch- that he created by changing everything was actually Thomas Wayne, where Bruce and Martha were killed instead of Thomas and Martha being killed. So Thomas Wayne became an older Batman. And this being, uh, you know, clearly Michael Keaton is older than Ben Affleck because we have him as Batman. It almost looks like we see Christian Bale's Batman in here as well. So I kind of wonder, is it possible that he is Thomas Wayne? Wouldn't that be a twist? He'd be Thomas Wayne, but he'd be in the style of the 89 Batman. But it could be that he's also just a Bruce Wayne Batman, and he's bringing back the exact one we know from up through Batman Returns. Because he's still got the classic Batmobile. And we're going to ignore Batman Forever and the Batman and Robin movie, I guess. So, but that's kind of being the main selling part. And they know that's what everybody is really excited about, is seeing Bruce Wayne back as Batman. Uh, So, yeah. So, that's everything I have on that. And you know what? Now it is time to... Uh, it's time to light the mu- start the music. It's uh, it, Or play the music. And it's time to light the lights. I couldn't even get it right now. <laughs> All right, so let's play the music and light the lights after all. Now, of course, I, I put this out to y'all about who your favorite Muppet was, favorite guest star, or any memories. Uh, and I put it mainly on social media to try to collect. And so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through some of that later. But I did go and dig up a little bit of history. And I even found, like, Encyclopedia Britannica had an entry. Now, what's, what's kind of fun? I can hit a button. Listen to this. The Muppet Show. The Muppet Show, TV comedy series created by Jim Henson that ran from 1976 to 1981. It featured the Muppets, a cast of now iconic characters that included Kermit the Frog, Miss Piggy, Fozzie Bear, and Gonzo, as they prepared for their weekly vaudeville show. While attending the University of Maryland, Henson and his future wife, Jane Nabel, created the puppet show Sam and Friends for a Washington, D.C., television station. The five-minute program introduced the first Muppets, including Kermit. The term Muppets was coined by Henson to describe the meld of marionettes and puppets that he used. They were usually made of sculptured foam rubber, plastic, and various fabrics. For the Muppet Show, most of the Muppets were hand puppets, which were voiced by the people operating them. Following graduation, A.B., 1960, Henson, along with his assistants, did commercials and brief spots on various television shows. In 1969 the Muppets began appearing on the children's television workshops program Sesame Street, bringing Henson and his humanoid animals extraordinary nationwide popularity. Yet Henson wanted to show that Muppets appealed not only to children but also to adults. After several unsuccessful attempts to produce The Muppet Show in the United States, Henson finally received support from the London-based television producer Lou Grade. The show began airing in 1976 and soon gained a global audience. Each week, Kermit the Frog, the harried producer of the fictitious show within a show, had his patience and composure tested by the unfunny comedian Fozzie Bear, the clownish and unpredictable Gonzo, and, most of all, the relentlessly amorous Miss Piggy. A different celebrity appeared in each episode, and over the series' five-season run such performers as Steve Martin, Carol Burnett, Gene Kelly, and Gladys Knight guest starred. The popularity of The Muppet Show inspired a number of motion pictures, including The Muppet Movie, 1979, The Great Muppet Caper, 1981, and The Muppets Take Manhattan, 1984, as well as books, magazines, records, commercials, and merchandise. After The Muppet Show ended in 1981, other series featuring The Muppets followed, including Fraggle Rock, 1983-87, a puppet show about subterranean creatures, and Jim Henson's Muppet Babies, 1984-91, a morning cartoon program. Prior to his death in 1990, Henson was in negotiations with the Disney company to sell the rights to the Muppets. The deal was finalized in 2004, and it transferred the trademarks and copyrights of most of the iconic characters to Disney. Later projects included the feature film Muppets Most Wanted, 2014, and The Muppets, 2015-16, a television series purporting to document the -the behind-the-scenes antics of Miss Piggy, Kermit the Frog, and their cohorts. 
Now, that's kind of nice that I can actually just hit a button and it'll just read the article for us, isn't it? That saves me a lot of talking. Well, I thought that was kind of a neat feature on the Encyclopedia Britannica. There's also a Muppet Fandom Wiki. Uh, I'm hoping one of these uh, would have a little bit more information. Uh, but it, it says the action in each episode was balanced between the onstage acts and the frantic activity backstage. One of the very few exceptions is episode 110, in which almost all sketches and skits are depicted on stage. The concept was reminiscent of old-time radio shows like the Jack Benny program, where the stars struggle to put on a weekly show amidst personal problems and an often uncooperative cast. Now, what is fun, if you were buying the seasons when they were releasing them on DVD, which we only got three of them released, uh, you could see a sort of a pilot episode. A lot of different pilot things. I think there's even one where they're more inside of a house instead of on a backstage. But they were going to do a show called Sex and Violence, and that, that was kind of the joke, because there would be no actual sex and violence. But that was gonna, what they were going to call the show, because they were trying to have an appeal where adults should enjoy the show as well. Uh, until that time, Jim Henson had also been doing a lot of commercials. Uh, Rolf of the Dog was a spokesman, and Kermit began as a lizard. Uh, the, they did have an afternoon show that they were running for a while, but did a lot of commercials and stuff before things really got rolling, as was mentioned in the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, office or office uh, <laughs> website, uh, where now I forgot where I was even going with that, but where it did mention that they were doing Sesame Street before, yeah. Ah, I forgot what I was saying before that. You ever have that happen to you where you, you just lose your sentence somewhere midway? Well, one of my favorite uh, bits on there that I find very, very funny is where Mark Hamill actually guest starred, but also so did Luke Skywalker was guest starring. That way they could keep the illusion that Chewbacca, uh, R2-D2, and C-3PO were themselves and weren't being portrayed by actors because Chewbacca does show up towards the end. But what I find very funny about this is the final sketch where they're doing something on the planet Kuzbane, which they frequently did on the Muppet Show, uh, but... They stop and they sing When You Wish Upon a Star and a Disney-esque castle rises from the background. There was some serious foreshadowing that no, I don't think anybody at that time had any idea that Disney would eventually end up owning both the Muppets and Star Wars. So I always found that to, to be quite interesting. Uh, now, I, I think the first episode that I was able to get is, you know, Time Life was releasing like best of collections that were hosted by Brian Henson. And you would get just a few of the episodes. And I remember getting the Steve Martin episode on one of those. Uh, I think the Elton John episode was on one and the Mark Hamill episode. And for a while, that was the only way you can get it. And I don't think even the Mark Hamill episode, I don't know if that was ever released on the those first three seasons. I don't think it was part of one of those seasons because it was around the time The Empire Strikes Back was about to come out. Uh, so you know, the Muppet Show was starting to wind down. Uh, it's in the last couple of seasons. I think it's like probably season four that he pops up because he's dressed even that Luke's, when he comes out as Luke Skywalker, uh, he's dressed in the outfit you would see him in um, from Empire. Now, I remember watching this. I don't think I watched them during their original run. Uh, I was you know a little older, uh, and I remember seeing mostly over at one of my grandparents' house, and that would be on a Saturday. Although the Muppet Show apparently aired on Sunday nights, but I would see the Saturday, so uh, apparently some repeats on some sort of syndication. I never found it at home, just only over at my grandmother's house, and we'd watch the Muppet Show. Uh, and I did see the Muppet movie, and uh, Great Muppet Caper, I remember, was on cable a lot. I used to watch that a lot. I used to have the LP of that soundtrack. I'd like to actually get a copy of that full soundtrack, actually, for the Great Muppet Caper. But uh, my memories listening to the soundtrack of it are different from the memories of what the film was actually like. Because when you're a kid, sometimes you take them up as a little bit more seriously than the wackiness that was going on. Uh, and uh, really, though, I really enjoyed that soundtrack. I, I do need to get myself a new copy of that one. But I remember watching, you know, we're focusing on the Muppet Show. I remember watching mainly when I was a little kid over at my grandmother's house. And uh, I'm still an, almost in a tide for first place between Kermit Fozzie and Gonzo's being my favorite. But Gonzo's probably my number one. Uh, like Kermit is that that every man and this that that good optimistical you know deals all the heat you know gets frustrated with stuff. But he's kind of like well, who you're trying to be. But really, I'm more of a Gonzo where I'm just a little weird uh, and a little wacky. And uh, just kind of a weird outsider. I've always kind of felt like that. I always related to Gonzo that way. And my sense of humor is more like Fozzie, where I just I make a lot of dumb jokes. So I'm somewhere like there. The, there's aspects, I think, of my personality in each one of them that I relate to. So they've always been my favorite. But let's see what some of you said. Uh, so here on uh, my own personal, those of you who actually know me, uh, on my own personal uh, post, uh, my cousin Melissa actually come up and uh, had a gif of Animal playing drums. And then also mentions Vincent Price, Prince, 
and more. Now, Prince was not actually on The Muppet Show. He was on The Muppets Tonight later. And, of course, we're mainly talking The Muppet Show. But the Vincent Price episode is a good one. And that does make me think of the Alice Cooper episode, which um, I'd have to go digging for the audio. But uh, whoa, whoa, it's been a while ago. But there was one time Alice Cooper actually came to town for a convention. And I did get a chance to ask him to, you know, to tell us about his experience on The Muppet Show. Uh, and that I do enjoy the Alice Cooper episode as well. Uh, another fellow, Chris Ward, I used to work with him, has a gif he put of Statler and Waldor- Waldorf. Uh, and then one of my old professors here, Eric Newsom, he says, I think it's funny that Roger Miller performing in the summertime on The Muppet Show wasn't as good as the iconic country trio performance of In the Summertime. Now, I don't know why it's it's funny that that performance by himself is not as good as when he performed with, like, Glenn Campbell and other stuff. I had to go look up that song. Uh, but, yeah, he always thought it's funny that when he performed on the Muppet Show, it's not as good. And it usually wouldn't, you know. It wouldn't always be, like, the best performance. Uh, my sister is posted up here and has Kermit and Fozzie, uh, basically from the Muppet movie. And then we have Sherry Kuntz uh, Moss, that is actually uh, Lost Boy Phillips' uh, brother, or sister, rather, uh, has a picture of Floyd and Janice, a gif, and she actually did send an email, like all the times I asked for emails, everybody was posting it here, but she actually did send me an email. It said, Rock's original flower power couple. Oh, that's all she has in the email? Really? That's it? Rock's original flower power couple. Well, at least it gives a reason for why. Oh, I was expecting more when I opened that email. Okay. But yeah, but yeah, they were the original Flower Power couple, and they're you know factor in pretty big. And the um, I didn't realize for a long time that they were supposed to have been a couple, Floyd and Janice. Uh, but uh, Floyd really, you know, he's Floyd Pepper. He's like, and they they even dive into the Electric Mayhem that how he was in the military, he was a sergeant, so he was Sergeant Pepper. And you realize, of course, he was dressed like a, a beetle. Uh, favorite guest star, she's got a picture of Steve Martin putting a shower cap on Kermit. Uh, not necessarily one of my favorite episodes with Steve Martin on there. Steve Martin, I, his stand-up, I never really got into. Uh, I, it just, I even bought one of his CDs once, and I just was like, uh, he's so good in movies. He's so funny in movies, but his, his stand-up and his performance on The Muppet Show, it is unique, that episode, because it's like they, they, he gets, he's mad because they cancel uh, his, the, that, the episode of The Muppet Show. Uh, and so they said, well, let's just do auditions. So Steve Martin comes out and does one of his just regular stand-up things. It's the only thing I think they could figure out to do with Steve Martin is just let him do his own thing. Uh, but I, what I do like about that is you get to Kermit singing It's Not Easy Being Green on an episode of The Muppet Show right there. Okay, now I also did ask this of people on the Neverland, the Fandom Nexus fan page. Uh, so the episode with John Cleese is legendary. That's from Eden. Uh, and I agreed with her. Yeah, that's definitely uh, that John Cleese one is great because he's just upset, you know, mad the whole time. Uh, just John Cleese getting to be his grumpy self. Uh, uh, and he's just funny no matter how he does it. Uh, Daniel Lewis uh, mentions Gonzo, of course, as his favorite. Uh, oh, we got to hear from Ricky Pope of uh, the Christian Nords Unite, which we mention him on every show because he helped out with the intro. And he says, I love The Muppets. I remember watching The Muppet Show on TV when it first came out. The Muppet Movie 1979 is great. I also love Muppets Take Manhattan, but the best Muppet movie is A Muppet Christmas Carol. So well done. Uh, we have James Carey mentioning Janice and Diana Winkler saying the episode with Christopher Reeve was my all-time favorite. Ooh, you know what? I don't know that I saw Christopher Reeve on an episode, but I do recall Christopher Reeve. Uh, I used to get the Muppet magazine, and around the time the fourth Superman movie was coming out, Christopher Reeve actually uh, appeared in Muppet magazine, and it was funny because they would they would do like they were being interviewed by a Muppet, and they so they'd take photos like they were actually interacting, uh, and he was inside the Muppet Labs with an experiment with uh, Bunsen and Beaker. So they get a little bit where they uh, they get information about the movie or whatever, and he talks about it. But also they have a storyline of what's happening during the interview uh, with his interaction with the Muppets. Uh, and I remember having that, and it was just a lot of uh, fun and making some jokes. And, you know, Bunsen and uh, Beaker not realizing that he's Christopher Reeve and he's not really Superman. So... Uh, but at the end of it, I remember like the, the little joke they have at the end. It's like, well, it's been nice hanging out here, but I really got to um, fly. So there was that little joke at the end. But yeah, I the Muppet Show was just a great show. And of course, launching a, a heck of a great film franchise there for a while. When I remember when it all turned around, uh, when Jim Henson passed away, and we just passed the anniversary, anniversary of his passing. Uh, and how things were going to change with a different voice for Kermit. And yet still showing that they still had something to offer the world. Uh, with those first few movies, they came back and started doing storylines for like the Treasure Island and the Christmas Carol. I do love those as well. Now, some of the stuff I think nowadays, I don't think is as good, but they do still every once in a while. They churn out something. 
that is still fun and worth watching. But that was our fun look back at The Muppet Show. Uh, and I hope you have enjoyed this episode. Uh, it is time, of course, that we wrap this up. So I want to remind you that you can send us an email, podcast at neverlandpodcast.com, and follow us on social media. And by the way, if you go to neverlandpodcast.com, there's a lot of good stuff right there, right in the middle of the page. You can click in there for my podcast reviews. There, if you happen to have a podcast, you want to collect your reviews from around the world for just a very low yearly fee. You can get all reviews sent right to your email, which, hey, we could use a few reviews. And there's actually ways to put get your review uh, sent to me right there on our own website because I'm we're on so many different podcast filters. And it'll collect all from every, every area that you leave a review. It'll send it to me. But it's just easier if you just do it there. It's more convenient for you probably. Also on NeverlandPodcast.com, you can find links for our shop. We have lots of different T-shirts and different kind of designs that you can have on a lot of different things, and it really does help us out, especially if you follow links on there to go to Patreon and help us out there. We're also, of course, on Twitter and Facebook. We have both a group and a fan page. But we want to remember to thank Karen Kennedy, Ricky Pope of Christian Nerds Unite, and Darren Wilhite of the Will Height and Wall Show for helping out with the introduction of this show. And don't forget, once again, Patreon.com slash Neverland. Podcast. And now, get lost in an adventure. Recently, our client Tommy met his banker to discuss continuing his father's restaurant legacy. In us, he found a partner that understood the importance of passing the torch. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy.